Hello, everyone. I'm honored and excited to be here today, and I'm even more excited to talk about practical approach to pain management in acute care settings, do's, don'ts, and some maybes. For this talk, I have financial disclosure. I've co-authored a book two years ago titled Taraskan's Pain Pocketbook and have received royalty. Other than that, I have nothing else to disclose. And I'm going to get right to it. As we all know, pain is one of the most common reasons patients seek care in a variety of acute care settings. Due to the volume of patients that comes with the painful presentations and due to the fact that poorly treated or untreated pain has an impact, long lasting impact with respect to chronic pain, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other psychological aberrancies, it is imperative for us, acute care providers, clinicians, to be champions, to be the best when it comes to pain management, and to be well-versed in a variety of analgesic armamentarium and to treat pain in a safe and effective manner. What got us in overall pain management in acute care setting more complicated is opioid epidemic. And as an ever-growing number of patients who are dying from opioid overdose, and frankly, ever-growing number of patients who are developing opioid use disorder, there is a great tendency to sort of limit and re-approach the treatment by singling out, by reducing, by replacing opioids. There's an ever-growing body of literature that clearly stipulates that we should be using opioids more judiciously or try to spare them at all and consider broader utilization of non-opioid analgesic modalities and non-pharmacological treatment modalities. Having said so, I put together this talk that basically sets a practical framework for acute care clinicians and providers with respect to what works, what doesn't, and what might have a potential when it comes to pain management. Let's get into it. Let's start with some general principle. Principle number one, management of acute pain in acute care setting should be patient specific and pain syndrome targeted that it based on a multimodal approach that combines pharmacological therapeutic modalities and pharmacological ones. Those in turn can be subdivided into non-opioid and opioid analgesics. We can use this multimodal approach by utilizing channels, enzymes, receptors, targeted analgesia. This comes based on our enhanced understanding of neurobiology of pain. And this particular combination or concept allow us to combine analgesics of different classes acting on different target sites, such as channels, enzymes, receptors. And that very synergy will provide better pain relief, allow us to use lower dosages, has potential to reduce side effects, and has potential to improve throughput of patients through the emergency department. Another point, which is very important to me, it is imperative for us to engage patients in shared decision-making when it comes to expectations, when it comes to overall describing natural trajectory of pain and with respect to what medication we're going to be using. It is imperative to understand that assessment of pain in acute care settings should be based on a need of analgesic to improve always or restore occasionally functional status of the patient rather than patient self-reported pain scale. However, with regard to pain scales, I'm a firm believer that a brief pain inventory short form is better than a unimodal numerical rating scale or visual analog scale as brief pain inventory assess quantitative and qualitative impact of pain makes on a patient. Next, when it comes to analgesics, it is imperative to once again engage patients in conversation about what medication, what route, what dose, what frequency, what are the alternatives, and what are potential for the long, short-term, immediate adverse effect? What are the benefit and risk of giving this particular medication? This is important as well. Now, in a setting when acute pain is lasting beyond expected duration of time, it is advisable to rule out complication of acute pain and reassess patients in about three or four days, and maybe switch them to non-pharmacological treatment modalities or non-opioid analgesias. So these are the basic principles. Now let's dive into non-pharmacological management of pain. We all know that ice, cold, immobilization, splinting, rest, sort of help patients to reduce pain significantly. And this type of non-pharmacological modality should be used all the time and extensively. In addition, my recommendation is to start using virtual reality particularly immersive component of it, even though data in adult literature is not there yet, but slowly but surely case reporting case series are very convincing that this modality helps. Music therapy 
is a very useful non-pharmacological adjunct to reduce pain in acute care settings. Type of music therapies we can use in acute care setting would be music assisted relaxation, music diversion, therapeutic listening. Data comes from the human literature with a great support that it actually works. In addition, practitioners in acute care setting might consider utilizing osteopathic manipulative techniques for patients presenting to their settings with a variety of pain syndromes of musculoskeletal, arthroidal, or myofascial origins. Now, what may work, because I said may, meaning there's not enough data. And the use of alternative or complementary medicines such as acupuncture, massage, yoga, CBTs, cognitive behavioral therapies, and even transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulations are yet to have a good data because there's no really clearly good randomized controlled trial systematic reviews supporting its use. Having said so, there is a place for them. In general, their application may be limited for a single visit, but continued investigation in their safety and efficacy is strongly encouraged. Now, let's move from non-pharmacological to pharmacological, and we're gonna start with opioids. We, as acute care providers, are uniquely positioned to provide safe and effective pain management for patients by using opioids judiciously and evidentially based. And we have a unique opportunity to combat an opioid epidemic by practicing opioid in a safe manner. It is imperative to engage patients in shared decision-making when it comes to opioid therapy, specifically by disclosing risks or benefits of opioid therapies, disclosing the route and dose and long and short-term side effects related to opioid therapies. When opioids are used for acute pain in acute care settings, in my opinion, it is imperative to try to combine them with either non-pharmacological treatment modalities or non-opioid treatment modalities, such as NSAIDs, maybe ketamine, maybe nerve blocks, and the list goes on and on and on. Combination is a key, however. It is important to talk to patients or counsel patients about the side effects related to opioid therapies. In immediate settings, uh, development of nausea and vomiting, the development of pruritus and long-term constipation, worst case scenario, development of respiratory depression, central nervous system depression, and of course, should you send patient home with opioid prescription, you have to counsel them on potential to develop misuse, abuse and diversion, development of tolerance and dependence, potential for development of opioid use disorder, and the worst of the worst, unintentional opioid overdose and death. Now, when considering administration of opioids in acute care settings or for acute pain, even chronic pain, it is advisable for us, clinicians and practitioners, to assess state respective prescription drug monitoring program, specifically for patients who's taking opioid chronically. Data that we gather from this should not be used as a punishment. Rather, we should be able to use the data to identify patients who are using excessive dosages and dangerous combinations, identify patients who have evidence of opioid misuse or even opioid use disorder, refer those patients for medication-assisted treatment clinics or even initiate treatment ourselves in within acute care settings. Now let's dive into more details. Let's talk about parenteral opioids. Parenteral opioids are effective, inexpensive, properly reversible agents that are very effective for the most presentation when it comes to acute pain. Key to remember, titration is the most important thing when it comes to parenteral opioids. In order to be successful, titration, regardless of the initial dosing regimens, whether or not you're choosing weight-based or fixed, is a paramount to success. You should be able to titrate opioids until pain gets optimized or patient refuses to have any more opioids or side effect becomes intolerable. Now, here is a very important concept. If opioids, commonly used opioids such as morphine, hydromorphone, or fentanyl, are dosed in the ED or acute care settings, by honoring equi-analgesic conversion, they do not differ with respect to analgesic efficacy. What they differ, however, though, in their potential to cause euphoria. I am a big proponent of the fact, I'm a big believer, that euphoria, or euphorogenic property of opioids, is a driving force behind an opioid epidemic. Euphoria, in turn, depends on lipophilicity, which stipulates which drug will cross blood-brain barrier faster and which drug will release more dopamine into the bloodstream. So if I had to combine analgesic efficacy and potential for euphoria and find a balance, morphine represents better balance between safety and efficacy, it has a less potential for euphoria in comparison to hydromorphone or even fentanyl. Hydrophone, hydromorphone has one of the highest potential for euphoria. And therefore, 
It should not be used as a first line defense when it comes to a variety of acute painful conditions. Its use should be resorted to patients who have opioid refractory pain or who cannot tolerate morphine due to side effects. It should not be routinely used as a first line defense. Now, there are situations when intravenous access is not readily available or unobtainable at all. And then the question becomes, what do you do? You deemed the patient is appropriate for opioids. Well, there are several options exist. All opioids, morphine, hydromorphone, and fentanyl can be used subcutaneously. And frankly, subcutaneous route is less painful and provides similar analgesic efficacy as intramuscular route. No skin, no problem. We can use intranasal route by using mucosal atomization device. Data clearly supports use of fentanyl hydromorphone for managing a variety of painful conditions by using intranasal route. With one intranasal route, we have a nebulization route through breath actuated nebulizer. Data clearly shows that nebulized fentanyl and nebulized morphine are very useful in managing, or at least initial management, of acute painful condition related to musculoskeletal system, such as fractures, contusion, dislocations, and such. Lastly, buccal route by using rapidly dissolvable fentanyl buccal tablets are a good analgesic modality at triage to at least in the first 5, 10, 15 minutes to try to alleviate patient's pain who presents to the D with variety of acute musculoskeletal pathology. One of my biggest speed beef is as follows. I am very much against intramuscular injections and specifically when it comes to opioids. Reason being, the notion of causing pain in order to alleviate pain never sits well with me, but taken further, repetitive intramuscular injections of opioids are notoriously known to cause pain in injections, have unpredictable absorption rate, which means they delay analgesia, but more importantly, they have potential to cause muscle necrosis, soft tissue infection, and myofibrosis, which replace muscle tissue with a connective tissue, which will require significantly higher dose to achieve some level of analgesia, but higher dose leads to higher degree of adverse effects. So please, do not use the IM route for opiate analgesia. Frankly, don't use the IM route for any analgesia at all. Few clinical pearls before we move to oral opioids. Opioids and renal failure. In the setting of moderate degree or severe degree of renal failure, renal sufficiency or renal failure, there should be a balance between risks associated with opioid therapy and analgesic effects. For that very reason, it is advisable to start opioids with the lower than recommended doses and slowly titrate them up while extending dosing intervals. But remember, if patients on dialysis, morphine should not be used. Hydromorphine should be used with a great caution and probably better opioid of all is fentanyl. Second clinical pearl, opioid-induced pruritus is essentially mediated process via pure stimulation of mu receptors. Therefore, should you have a patient who develops pruritus after receiving a single dose or multiple dose of intravenous or parental op opioids, consider utilizing ultra low dose of naloxone with a starting dose of 0.25 microgram per kilogram per hour, rather than using parental antihistamines such as diphenhydramine, which we notoriously know to potentiate high and then respiratory depression of an opioid. And the last clinical pearl, I want to briefly talk about opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is a rare event specifically for patients who's taking opioid chronically, which implies that pain gets worse in a setting of escalating opioid therapies and usually manifest by neuro excitation. Patients scream, patients become very unruly, very unhappy. They demand more opioids, but pain gets worse. Should you be able to identify patients who suffer from opioid-induced hyperalgesia, consider utilizing non-opioid alternative do not give them opioids because it will perpetuate the vicious cycle of worsening pain in the setting of opioid therapy. All right, now let's move on to oral opioids. Oral opioids are frequently used in EDs in different acute care settings, and for the most part, in between, they're fairly similar. There is no really appreciable difference when it comes to analgesia between common use opioids, oxycodone, hydrocodone, or even morphine sulfate immediate release. What they differ, though, again, is with respect to cause euphoria. Euphoria leads to so-called high. High leads to a self-destructive pattern of willingness to use this medication again and again and again. And if again, I'm going to find a balance between analgesic efficacy and safety, here where it comes to. Opioids should not be used for more than three days for the most part and should be used in lowest effective dose when you discharge patients home. In addition to lower dose and lowest effective time, it's imperative 
to talk to patients about proper opioid storage and disposal, or even more importantly, consequences of failing to do so. Because household residual opioids are one of the main culprits of having family members to be set on the path of opioid misuse, as a finding unused medications in the bathroom cabinets, for example. Now, once again, they're similar with their analgesic efficacy. They differ when it comes to euphoria. And from that perspective, oxycodone should not be used as the first line, second line, frankly, as the third line. I would push properly boundaries to say should not be used at all in acute care settings because in a properly analgesic conversion dosing regimens, it does not provide any different or any better analgesia in comparison to hydrocodone or morphine sulfate immediate release. However, oxycodone is about six times more euphorogenic than morphine and about five and a half times more euphorogenic than hydrocodone. And this is a number one agent that is truly responsible for all, about 75% of unnecessary death related to prescribing opioids overdose. For that very reason, oxycodone should not be used. Should you still decide to prescribe an oxycodone, use lowest effective dose, which is a five milligram. Second, hydrocodone three times more frequently prescribed than oxycodone for medical purpose, but three times less used for non-medical purposes. Hydrocodone is less euphoric than oxycodone, but more euphoric than morphine sulfate immediate release. I would push for not using hydrocodone as a first-line defense. I would probably resort as a second. Tramadol should not be used under no circumstances, it's my opinion, in DD for a variety of acute or exacerbation of acute and chronic painful conditions. Tramadol has a very bad side effect profile, has a very unique drug-drug interactions, has a great potential for misuse, abuse, dependence, addiction, and overdose and death. And studies show that tramadol is one of the weakest opioids and has no analgesic advantages over ibuprofen or acetaminophen. So please do not use tramadol, neither on inpatient settings or at discharge. Then the question becomes, so what we should be using? You told us not to use oxycodone, not to use tramadol, be cautious with hydrocodone. What's there else left? Well, let's talk about the morphine sulfate immediate release tablets. Morphine sulfate immediate release tablets is administration of it is associated with a significant lesser degree of euphoria and consequently less abuse potential. Acute care providers, us, acute care clinicians, should consider using morphine sulfate immediate release as a first line defense should we choose to use an opioid for a variety of acute painful condition due to the following has a similar analgesic efficacy to oxycodone and hydrocodone, has less euphoria and consequently less abuse potential, has a less street value, consequently less diversion. In a higher dose, it causes the dysphoria, patient becomes nauseous, weak, sweaty, feel miserable, and they don't want to take this medication again. And based on available literature, potential for abuse liability and likability is significantly less with morphine sulfate immediate release. So it has been my practice and my strong recommendation to use oral opioids such as morphine sulfate immediate release as an opioid of choice. Let me sum this up for now while we talk about opioids. Remember the title of the talk is do's, don'ts, and maybes. So when it comes to opioid therapies, what we should do? We do titrate opioids to the effect. We do need to consider euphorogenic property of opioids when it comes to their administration and prescribing. We do need to utilize subcutaneous intranasal or nebulized route for opioid administration should intravenous access become unavailable. We do need to adjust those in patients with the chronic kidney insufficiencies. We do use intravenous naloxone for patients with opioid-induced pruritus, and we should be using oral morphine sulfate immediate release as a first choice opioid. What we shouldn't do, we should not be using IM route for opioid administration. We should not be using hydromorphone as a first line opioid defense. We don't use opioids in opioid-induced hyperalgesic states. We do not prescribe long-acting sustained release external release opioids, including fentanyl patches. And we do not use and prescribe oxycodone and tramadol in acute care settings and at discharge. Moving on to non-opioid analgesic. Let's talk about a brief description to it. First drug, acetaminophen. Well, the most commonly used medication is alone or in combination with opioids and non-opioids. No matter how you're going to tweak it, it provides at the best modest analgesic efficacy. Recent data clearly shows that combination of acetaminophen with ibuprofen doesn't really provide any superior analgesia to ibuprofen alone. And I just want to emphasize that original euphoria or analgesic euphoria when intravenous acetaminophen became available to 
every single provider kind of settled down a little. Just remember, first dose of IV acetaminophen may be beneficial. However, subsequent dosing regimen has no difference from oral and rectal dosing. Most importantly, there's a huge cost difference, about a hundredfold greater, and marginal analgesic efficacy or superiority is negligible. So it is my opinion not to use intravenous acetaminophen routinely. However, on a case-by-case -case basis, when patients are unable to tolerate or have contraindication to either NSAIDs or opioids and indications seems to be feasible, we might consider using a single dose of intravenous acetaminophen in acute care settings. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, we all know how to use them. We've been using them for centuries. Few concepts that often to neglect it. First concept, concept of analgesic sealing. It's a pharmacological phenomenon that implies after reaching certain dosing threshold, any future or further increase in the dose will not result in additional analgesia. Thus, contrary to what we all taught, being taught in all the textbook, there's an analgesic dose of NSAID that is significantly lower than full anti-inflammatory dose. Examples, prescribe more ibuprofen at about 600, 800, but analgesic ceiling dose of ibuprofen is 400. Analgesic ceiling dose of naproxen to 20 per dose. Ketorolac, regardless of the route of administration, is 10 milligram. Daclofenac, 50. The only stipulation I want to make, patient whose BMI is greater than 30 may need to have a slightly different dose adjustment because of their body mass index and they need to get slightly higher dose. Other than that, utilize analgesic ceiling dose for a variety of acute painful conditions, especially non-inflammatory in character. Second uh, concept is NSAIDs rotation. And I want to thank my amazing colleague and friend, Dr. Pescatori, who brought the light to this very important concept. NSAID as a class has six subclasses and should one of the subclass medications such as ibuprofen do not work don't throw them away right away you may consider switching for the different subclass let's say the clofenac or vice versa and give another two three four days worth of systemic NSAIDs and see what's going to happen so under analgesic ceiling and under NSAIDs rotation lastly topical NSAIDs highly underutilized modality specifically for patients with variety of acute musculoskeletal pathology sprain strain bruise contusion fracture probably less likely in recent development that uh, well, the clofenac gel became over-the-counter, even though still expensive, there's a great push. And in my firm belief that we should be using topical at much greater extent for a variety of acute musculoskeletal pathology than systemic NSAIDs. Lastly, I'm going to wrap up the NSAIDs component with the fact that should you consider prescribing systemic non-steroidal, consider utilizing lowest effective dose, aka analgesic ceiling dose, for the shortest duration of time. Moving along. Before I get to different classes, I forgot to mention one thing just recently. Some of you may, may not heard that FDA approved Advil dual combination when acetaminophen has been combined with ibuprofen. And data comes from the dental literature. Obviously, when you get your wisdom tooth removed, you probably have so much pain and apparently results were great. However, stipulation, which I look into myself, the combination of acetaminophen and ibuprofen failed to provide superior analgesia to ibuprofen alone. So I have mixed feelings, and I don't know how this medication is going to play out. It's over the counter. There's some potential to it. But I'm, as of right now, I'm not feeling the joy. And we can probably talk afterwards in details if we need to. Ketamine, one of my favorite medications. As some of you may, may not know, the ketamine has been used over a decade in a variety of acute care settings, on the patient settings, in sub-dissociative, aka known as a low dose analgesic dose with a range 0.1 to 0.3 milligram per kilogram for a variety of acute traumatic, non-traumatic painful condition, for a variety of chronic painful condition in the setting of opioid tolerance, in the setting of a patient with opioid use disorder, in the setting of cancer pain, and I can just go on and on and on. One of the, it's effective, it's fairly safe. However, one of the major limiting factors when it comes to ketamine therapy is the degree of bothersomeness related to psychoperceptual side effects. One particular effect stands out, it's feeling of unreality. What's good about it that we know that this particular side effect is dose and rate dependent. So if in order to offset or reduce development of feeling unreality, which may be bothersome to a patient, I propose to utilize ketamine as a short infusion. We can do 0.3 mix per kilo max, or we can lose even lower dose, and you can do it over 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Remember, lower the dose and longer the duration of infusion, side effects, those psychoperceptual side effects will become less, less severe. 
Furthermore, there's a great deal of data supporting continuous ketamine infusion. Personally, myself, I've done it for over five years. There's a great deal of support for using for neuropathic pain, opioid tolerant pain, or even in acute period settings when opioids or single infusion of ketamine did not achieve appropriate analgesia. Lastly, in the case when intravenous access is unobtainable, remember ketamine can be given subcutaneously, intranasally, and via nebulization route. Local anesthetics, everybody's darling. We know how much we love local anesthetics for variety of indication and variety of form and routes. And we do know how they work. They provide great deal of analgesia and enter hypologesia and anti-inflammation by non-competitively blocking sodium channel in neuronal tissues. And we all know that for the topical, we can use creams, we can use patches, we can use viscous lidocaine, we can use uh, local anesthesia, we can use regional anesthesia, we can use even lidocaine for systemic indications as an intravenous infusion. My personal belief is that ultrasound guided nerve blocks have revolutionized the way we approach to acute musculoskeletal traumatic injury, including extremity and trunk. In addition to it, there's a great deal of cutaneous pathology that nerve block can benefit immensely. We do know there's a great deal of help when patient comes in with isolated muscle spasm, muscle pain, and we do use trigger point injections. Recently, there have been great attention paid to use paracervical, paraspinous muscle injection for patient with a headache, or even um, utilizing local anesthetic to block this phenopolitan ganglion to reduce pain in patient presenting to the headache to the emergency department. So as you can see, multitude of routes and magnitude of ways of using local anesthetics. Uh, data, however, uh, when it comes to systemic administration of lidocaine is not as convincing. Data comes from overseas. None of the studies were done in the ED with few exceptions in the United States. Most data focused on managing pain of renal colic. However, systematic review meta-analysis failed to demonstrate analgesic superiority of lidocaine in comparison to opioids or NSAIDs. And my personal belief is I would not recommend to use this medication as a first-line defense against renal colic, not even second. However, in a situation where patients either unable to tolerate opioids or NSAIDs, you may consider using this on a case-by-case -case basis. Anti-dopaminergic and neuroleptic agents, we know how to use them. We do use them on a daily basis. Great deal of indications for intractable headache, or regular headache, tension headache, migraine headache. We use this medication for intractable nausea and vomit related to chronic abdominal pain, abdominal angina. Uh, hyperemesis syndromes, uh, cannabis-induced hyperemesis, the list goes on and on. They're effective, they're useful, and they should be used either alone or in combination with non-opioid and opioid analgesia. Steroids, systemic steroids have been proven to be effective in reducing recurrence of the migraine headaches. Patients come to acute care settings. Uh, medial dose spec sometimes used for patients with neuropathic pain is a form of appeal with a tapering dose over a few weeks and topical NSAIDs sometimes used should patient have a flare of their uh, rheumatological conditions you can use topically on the joints and they've been found very effective in the emergency department as well. Anticonvulsant such as gabapentin and pregabalin well, I would not recommend to use them in acute care settings. Maybe in an isolated situation where patient has some neuropathic component to it. There are effective for patients with neuropathic pain, diabetic neuropathy, maybe post-herpetic neurology, but in acute care setting, they fail to demonstrate any superiority over actually placebo. More importantly, side effect profile of this anticonvulsant is actually malignant. A great deal of oversedation can tip elderly people and cause some traumatic injury. Recent data, however, points towards the fact that anticonvulsants are potentiating opioids with respect to initial high and their respiratory depression. So people who combine anticonvulsant and opioid together have more chances of dying from respiratory depression than those who do not. So my firm belief is patient with neuropathic component to it, you may initiate anticonvulsant in DD. However, titration takes place, they need to get to the right dose over the course of two to three or four weeks. And if you cannot establish follow-up, I'd rather not to use them at all. Lastly, so-called muscle relaxant. Well, I'll make it clear, they don't work. And personally, I believe they should not be prescribed for any type of pain. So-called muscle spasm, muscle uh, tension, they just don't work. Great deal of work done by Dr. Friedman and colleagues. Basically study every single medication you can see on the slide. And he failed to demonstrate any analgesic superiority when this medication added to NSAIDs or acetaminophen. Side effect can be malignant, sedation, unpleasant sensation. So if medication doesn't work, don't use it. However, 
in the patients who exhibit clear evidence of spasticity, either related to spinal cord injury or due to spinal cord injury or spinal cord pathology or post-stroke pain, baclofen initiated in India, 10 milligram, may have some uh, analgesic effect by relaxing and by relieving the spasms. But this medication probably should be used in conjunction with uh, ear and ear surgeons or neurologists. Let's sum this up when it comes to non-opioid analgesia. What to do in acute care settings? When you prescribe NSAIDs, do honor NSAIDs analgesic sealing and NSAIDs rotation. Do use liberally topical NSAIDs. Do use sub-dissociative dose ketamine as an adjunct to either opioid or non-opioid or alone for a variety of acute and, cro acute and chronic painful conditions. Do use local anesthetic broadly by various routes, topical, local, regional, and systemic. Do use antidepaminergic and neuroleptic agents for a variety of painful presentations. And do consider systemic and topical steroids based on the patient's presentations as well. What not to do. Do not use intravenous acetaminophen routinely. Do not use intravenous lidocaine as a first-line defense for patients with a variety of acute painful conditions. Do not use gapapentanoids for acute pain, and especially do not combine them with opioids. And do not routinely use muscle relaxant for everybody's darling acute back pain. They just don't work. And I'm going to wrap it up with a some of the drugs that have potential to be very useful adjunct when it comes to a variety of acute painful conditions in acute care settings. Dexmedetomidine, despite the fact that it's very expensive, can be used as an adjunct to ketamine, sometimes to opioids for managing pain of neuropathic origin, opioid tolerant pain, opioid induced hyperalgesic states, and a variety of chronic pains. Sub anesthetic dose propofol has been found very useful in managing multi drug resistant migraine headache. And just recently, and once again, thanks to my amazing friend and colleague, Dr. Pescatori, who put beautiful several articles out on describing use of this medication, intranasal oxytocin and calcitonin, calcitonin gene peptide receptor antagonist can be used in acute care setting for patients presenting to the, the setting with a variety of headache pathology, particularly migraine headache. Let me sum this up. We as uh, acute care providers, as acute care clinicians, are the champions. I call us, we are the acute care algiatrist. We're a king and queens of pain management. And frankly, I take great deal of pride to admitting that we do a hell of a great job, but we can do things slightly even better. We have this amazing chest with a great multitude of non-pharmacological and pharmacological therapeutic modalities. We just need to use them safely and effectively by utilizing the very simple principle, patient-specific pain-targeted approach by combining this class of analgesics or non-analgesics and definitely use evidence to support it use. If we do this, we'll be very successful. Patient will be very thankful and will improve overall pain management across the whole spectrum of variety of acute painful conditions in acute care settings. Thank you for your time. Hello. Rick. Hello. Hi. Sergey, I, I, I really Sergei. like it that you have so a few opinions about what should we should be doing. You, bat, you beat around the bush so much, you know, kind of thing, you know. This <laughs> How is, can there be any questions now? Let me introduce you to our, our panel. Um, let's see. Uh, Ken Milne. Ken is from uh, Canada, Ontario here. He just showed us uh, the temperature up there is uh, minus what something or other. It is in the minuses up there. Uh, Rick Pescato, uh, I should say, Ken is the um, author of the uh, weekly uh, blog, The Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. He's showing us minus one in London, Ontario. But that's in fake degrees, I think. No, I think it's a real one there. Do it with there. the metric system, Pescator. <laughs> <laughs> that's not an American. Um, Mike Sharma. Mike uh, has participated in our boot camp courses and is a um, PA who has gotten a lot of his training, uh, as I mentioned, in Iraq, and then has, has done a lot of work in terms of teaching PAs, preparing for their board ex uh, exams, and works in Texas and a couple of settings. Michael, hello. Hello. Um, 
Rick Pescator is uh, in, in the middle of my screen. Rick's uh, in uh, actually in South Jersey um, and is an emergency physician, writes a, a lot in emergency medicine news and does the uh, audio summary of emergency medicine news each month with a colleague. And, um, and now is, uh, is one of the uh, leaders of the health department of the state of Delaware. And I, I, I guess you probably are the personal physician now of uh, uh, Mr. Biden era. I'll call you <laughs> over. Only. He you know, wishes. I'm... I wish. How's his ankle, by the way? Is he doing okay? I, what, didn't he have a hairline foot fracture? Come on, Sharma. I think he needs some topical NSAIDs on that. He does. He's no blocks. NSAIDs, right? <laughs> Sergey is there. Um, Martha uh, Roberts is, um, she's the, the ringleader of this project, actually. This is her idea, and I want to thank you because um, I, I do think that this is an extraordinarily important topic because uh, you don't have to be a great diagnostician. You don't need to read a lot of books. To do this all you need to do is have the mentality to relieve pain and have this armamentarium out there and i think that we all ought to be really at the top of our game when it comes to doing this and that's why i think sergey's work has been so important and the idea now is to disseminate as much as we can so we have a you know, did i catch everybody here uh, yeah i think i think I've, oh martha nurse practitioner is uh has been uh, is working in a number of facilities in the UC Davis area and was actually there recently and is about to work at Kaiser um, and also does work for Emergency Medicine News, is, uh, writes a, and does a video th thing called the, uh, the Procedural Pause, which she's been doing for a long time with her dad, Dr. Jim Roberts, who is the uh, father of Roberts and Hedges, the procedure book that is the Bible uh, for the procedures in our, our specialty. So I think that is everybody. And there have been a bunch of questions coming. And you remember, the question that we think is the most outrageous, the most wonderful, the most, most um, compelling is going to get this ridiculously generous gift of any course that we do. Um, and I think that we also have a couple of the pain management books that uh, Sergey is the associate editor of, and Rick Pescator has written a number of chapters in there, I believe, as a contributor. So thanks so much. And Rick, I think that you should tell us a little bit about your pain background because you're not just a regular old ER pain doc here. Well, I'm something, but if anything, I'm a, on, student, I'm a student of Sergey's to my, he's on my right here on my screen. I, you know, I've learned just an absolute ton and an absolute ton. I, I got a corner down here to Martha Roberts, just the, the procedures that have enabled me to bring analgesia to patients in the ER, just truly tremendous. But I did have the opportunity to be a medical director of a pain management clinic for some time uh, where we saw patients with chronic pain syndromes. Um, that was a, a heavily, um, a clinic that was heavily invested in ketamine infusion for chronic pain, which was truly a revolutionary experience for my career, um, but also was uh, uh, significantly invested in transitioning patients off of opioids uh, into non-opioid pain management strategies. So you've had a lot of experience that is certainly unique to emergency medicine in that you are, you went the next step. And so um, our conversations in the past have indicated you have a wide variety of interesting things to do. Like you've been doing the uh, neck injections for a long time when in fact, it's, it's been really very difficult, I think, for those to become incorporated into emergency medicine, even though they've been out there for at least 10 years, probably, probably longer but they've just not been embraced. And so we're still giving, you know, migraine patients kind of their morphine shots. Oh, well, yeah, that's Rick, painful. Ricky, you also give a, an absolutely phenomenal talk at our courses when we do our boot camps. Very powerful. I actually was very moved by that talk on, on opioids and the opioid epidemic. And if you haven't caught that talk, I believe it's on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can get a taste of actually what some of our courses are actually like. But you know, I have to admit I, before we get started that um, that was a very, very compelling talk because it made it particularly clear that all we're thinking about now is COVID. What, while on the yeah. side, the opiate epidemic is getting worse and worse and worse, worse but and it's worse. just kind of like not, not big news anymore. Before it was big news because 
there was no COVID. Now there's COVID, which is taking up all of the bandwidth. And the opiate thing is, is just kind of like, oh, we, we forgot about it. Well, today we're going to talk a lot about opioids. And it's not like I just wrangled a bunch of Joe Schmoes off the street. Everyone that you're seeing here right now has a lot of experience in treating pain and working in the emergency department. Um, there's a lot of literature out there. And I think one of the people that scour the literature the best is Ken. And if you haven't taken a listen to some of his SGEM, the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine, you really should check it out. This will keep you up to date on some of the latest and greatest stuff. Um, in fact, we just did a recent pain-like blog, right, Ken? We did a buffering lidocaine with uh, sodium bicarbonate to help ease injection pain, which is just a simple thing that you can do in the ER to help a patient not have as much pain when they get this painful lidocaine injection. Do you, do you so little the, things. Do you remember the song, Little Things Mean a Lot? And little things do mean a lot. And I think like the idea of using buffered lidocaine is kind of, if you're not going to use marking, to use buffered lidocaine and to use that 25 gauge needle and inject slowly and don't distend the tissues. And there's a whole litany of things that, that you can do to do this better if you, and the literature supports all of this. Yes, absolutely. So the reason why we do these faculty forums in general is so that we can engage with you. We know we're not with you. We do offer a plethora of courses from critical care, uh, the boot camps. We have a heart course. There's so much. And if you want to check out what we do, if you're new to us, go to ccme.org and just take a look. But as for the faculty forum today, we want to answer your questions. We've gotten a lot of questions in advance, which we're very appreciative for. And they're very good, interesting questions. Some of them, I think, uh, definitely we'll debate about. But typically, when we have our Q&A events, we like to give you all the information the best that we can, and then you make your clinical decision. This is a guide. Uh, it's not uh, a law. And, you know, every patient is going to be different. And just keep that in mind when you are referencing some of these ideas. May not work for everybody, but this is what we are offering you today. And, and Sergey's talk today, again, I don't know how you did that in that short amount of time. It was fabulous and it was wonderful. And we're very appreciative. Thank yes, thank you. Thank um, you. Crazy enough, we still have a few questions that people want to ask. Um, but I was actually listening to, uh, a famous chef, Alice Waters. If anybody knows her, it's the holiday season, everybody's cooking. And if you start with really good ingredients, you don't have to do much to them. Right. So I felt like from your talk, if you have a good ingredient that does the right job, you should stick with that. And even more so it kind of hit home with the acetaminophen and Advil combo that's being released for the holiday season for people for pain. And a lot of people have been asking, and I know you sort of addressed it, but could we talk a little bit more about combined acetaminophen and NSAIDs in a single dose pill first? Sure. Uh, so originally, and I just want to point it out that I'm a big proponent of combining acetaminophen and ibuprofen together for a variety of acute painful conditions in DD with the premise that there's no contraindication to it. And there's some science behind it because despite the fact that acetaminophen seems to be working as an anti-inflammatory agent, receptors are different. And as you know, my push for the third concept that you combine analgesic of different classes, different receptors, this is supposed to be working better. It looks like FDA finally heard the prayers and maybe consumers request to have this type of thing. And they did put together a unique pill, Advil extra, that has acetaminophen and ibuprofen in it. But to be honest with you, my eagerness to use this combination has been actually refuted lately or recently by several huh. very beautifully designed randomized trials. And I had a pleasure of being on Skeptic Guide for Mercy Medicine. And we had a wonderful discussion about one of the trials. And it seems to me that you don't really need to add acetaminophen to ibuprofen. And my personal belief is no matter how you tweak it, acetaminophen is the, is, it's, it's a weak drug. It provides modest, at, at the most, pain control. So if you really have to choose between one or two, I probably would go with NSAIDs. And you know, if you press, you may add it to it, but just science and evidence as of right now, just recently, 
in the COVID year, really, really pushing towards don't really need to do this. And if you really need to do this, if there's no effect to it, just don't do it. Remember, acetaminophen is not a benign drug after all. There was a lot of good discussion in the YouTube chat. And if you're not there, take a look at it. But talking about uh, pediatric fracture pain, and there's a lot of opinions on ibuprofen and NSAIDs for fracture. And, oh, it's going to delay fracture healing. And, and people have heard a lot of things from their favorite orthopods about don't give NSAIDs for uh, fracture pain because you're going to delay healing here. I think that all that's been debunked. You still see a lot of that pushed from the orthopedic side of the house. But if you look at the literature here, NSAIDs are a great way to start treating fracture pain without potential complications down the road. I think some of this, the thoughts towards that were some of these studies that dealt with poorly healing fractures and the use of NSAIDs in those malunions and things like that. And there was some kind of talk about associations there, but if we're talking about kind of fresh fractures, there's no evidence that points towards kind of acute fractures having complications due to early NSAID use. You know, the one thing is just to reiterate when it comes to NSAIDs, those and duration matter. And everything boils down to it. You know, you might have a fracture, but in acute setting, there is nothing wrong to give an NSAID up to three days, even up to five days in a properly, uh, range those in intervals. You know, it's hard to extrapolate data when it comes from mice literature and put it into humans and said, you know what, don't do it because mice don't seem to be doing well with NSAIDs. So that's my opinion. Everything has a merit. There is a dose and there is a duration and just stick it to it. Well, let's just get a little bit. That actually brings me to one of our first burning questions in the Slido content um, that Sergey and I have talked about before. And this is specifically about NSAIDs um, after a specialist. So, you know, Mike, you were talking about an orthopod. Um, this person wants to know, ha, uh, Christine, she asks, how does one deal with gastric bypass patients who insist they cannot take an NSAID per their doctor? No allergy and no other contraindications. Don't so all jump I... at once. <laughs> okay. Sergey, please. Sure. So once again, um, in a situation when there is an acute pain, you have a bypass and you just have something, have a musculoskeletal injury or what have you, not related to bypass injury. And you in need of an analgesic, short course of NSAIDs given in within the analgesic cylinders, max five days, usually about three days in combination with something else should be okay. And it should not be harmful. The main concern when it comes to bariatric surgery patients is they're prone to ulcerations in a small bowel and stomatic uh, regions of it. It just so happens the statistics based on the data NSAIDs seem to be worsening rates of patients who develop those marginal ulcerations and consequence to it, uh, GI bleed. But if you use NSAIDs in acute, very acute setting, up to 72 tops, maybe 96 hours, and you use them in within the analgesic ceiling regimen, you should be probably okay. So I would not deny an NSAID. I would not use it on chronic basis. I would not use it for months to months to come, obviously. But in acute period, I would probably use it. Martha, the can I uh, pick up fine. a few things of those? Yeah, please. So I just want to thank Sergey for being a guest on the podcast and discussing that combination of acetaminophen plus NSAIDs. And I, I hope people got the point that there is no high quality evidence that a combination, even though it's coming out for the holidays, apparently, there's no evidence that a combination is better. And so if we don't have um, good evidence of superiority, then the only thing we're left with is additional harm. And as Sergey has said repeatedly, these are not benign drugs. Uh, it all depends and you have to be selective about your patients. And so there might be some patients that you're more concerned about their liver, whereas there's other patients you may be more concerned about their GI tract and, uh, and you'll have to tailor it. And talking to patients like that, saying, I'm thinking out loud, this is what I'm thinking will work best, um, can really empower the patient, uh, make them feel like, you're involved and you care about what's going on. And it's not just call, take two of these and call your primary care physician in the morning kind of thing. Um, and setting expectations. And I, that, that's one of the things I just wanted to have the opportunity to say that one of the most important things I've learned in pain management is to set expectations, whether it's back pain, whether it's an acute injury or whether it's chronic pain. Because having patients understand that getting to zero on a zero to 10 point scale, maybe unrealistic. And we should be trying to not eliminate pain, but eliminate suffering so that they can still enjoy life, do their activities of daily living and find joy in the world, even though they may have two out of 10 pain. 
And so I just wanted to jump in there and say, high quality evidence doesn't support the combination pill and tailor your medications appropriately. Engage with your patients like Sergey had mentioned about shared decision-making and make sure you set expectations so you don't set people up for failure. Actually, that's, that's, that's really, 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 really great. great. I'm glad you said that. And it leads me to my very, my very next question, question um, that, I'd um, like that I'd like to kind of direct to PSP and yourself. And yourself. Answer, 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 all of you can chime in. Yes, yes. Oh, is oh, my, my, my mic being hating badly? badly? So while she's while she's uh, doing that, um, Sergey, I do have a, another podcast coming out that looks at NSAIDs and uh, delayed uh, healing from fractures. And spoiler alert: it it's an observational trial, so it's associations only. But spoiler alert: there was no higher association of delayed or non-union with NSAIDs. There was uh, with COX-2 inhibitors, and there was also delayed wound healing with opioids. Now, these are all associations, and so there could have been other reasons that we don't know about why somebody got an opioid versus an NSAID, but certainly this is more information to reassure us that, uh, you know, and actually, even when I'm sending patients uh, to follow up fracture clinic, I sort of say, you know, the orthopedic surgeon, if I don't know who it is, may may question this, and and I understand that, and um, uh, I'm happy to talk to them about it, and uh, I'm not aware of any high quality evidence that it's going to delay your bone healing. Just to burst the bubble before they <clears throat> say something about me in clinic. <laughs> that goes um, back to your setting expectations, though. I think that that's completely yeah, reasonable. exactly right. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, well, so that gets me back on track. How's my mic? Is it better? Mm -hmm. Yay. Much better. So, so setting expectations, guys, this is, this is important. And, um, I know is a problem for, in many of your departments, uh, Alicia long, she asks, I would like to ha have some guidance in analgesia for the manipulative malingering drug seeking mm -hmm. population who have allergies to Ketorolac, all NSAIDs, Ultram, et cetera. And what seems to be the working for them is basically Dilaudid. I'm all about treating pain. Good for you. Um, appropriately. Um, but she doesn't want to establish an addict. You know, I, I, if I, I could jump in there, I mean, that's a, listen, it's a tough situation to approach a patient who may have a secondary gain, um, uh, with associated with why they're pres presenting to the emergency department. But we have to look at that right off the bat and look at first, take a look at our language, right? One of the first things that we want to do and remember that, um, uh, people aren't addicts, people have substance use disorder. Um, and, and that's very much the key that this is a substance use disorder and we treat all disorders the same. And that's with uh, a caring medical approach and an evidence-based and caring medical approach. And when we look at patients who present to the emergency department um, with a, a secondary complaint, it, it is contingent upon us to drill down as much as we can uh, to what is the fundamental reason why this patient is presenting with a, a secondary uh, gain to seek out uh, opioids, for example. And if the condition here is one of substance use disorder, perhaps we can drill down on that a bit further and recommend interventions such as uh, buprenorphine for the treatment of substance use disorder. So I want to I want to just pull that thread a little bit, and, and I completely understand that our goal here is to say, you know, what is the best approach in these conditions who are extremely difficult, um, and, and it's a very tough situation, and, and this is why I think um, the multimodal non opioid approach to pain management is one that's so very powerful, and why all the things that uh, Dr. Motov just reviewed um, is that analgesic armamentarium that we can bring to bear, and we speak with that patient even if we suspect a secondary gain, we say something to the extent of. You know, I, I understand that you're seeking pain control and I want to do everything I can to help you get control of that pain. That's not going to be with an opioid uh, tool. We're going to use other tools in my toolkit. And then we go down that armamentarium that we've established through, through, through Sergey. Yeah, I'm and you, 100 percent with you. Ken, go ahead. You no, know, I know. I was just going to say that's a great way to start, Rick, because, you know, if if we're not in a uh, given affirmative right up front, people tune us out. So if they say, you know, I want a hundred Dilaudid and you say, no, they've stopped listening. But if you say, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you for bringing it up. And they're like, 
okay, I was expecting, you know, more of a fight this time uh, if they have been in multiple times. And if you say, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you. Let's drill down on that. I want to get your pain under control too, because isn't that why you're here? It's about the pain, right? So let's drill down on that. So I really liked what you did there. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you 100%. They'll be often surprised and frankly flabbergasted by the fact that physician actually a, acknowledge their pain and willing to spend more than 30 seconds listen. at the bedside yeah. and listen. And this yeah. is the most important thing because while you unveil, you know, there's a say goes, it takes 30 seconds to write somebody for either Percocet or even give somebody the lot. It takes an average 30 minutes plus to actually have a conversation, find out what's the basis for patients, allergy, denial of everything else, and particular pre proclivity for certain opioids. So what you guys said, it's totally true. And, you know, setting no. your, your expectations, you're not going to fix whatever this person's long time, 50 year old problem is, you know, sometimes we take on a lot and we think that our one visit is going to change everything about this person, but you certainly could change the next 24 to 72 hours for this person and at least give them a better, um, feeling about their, their visit and their pain and give them some other options to go to as well. Well, I'll tell you, I, I like to take patients like this and focus on what would, what would, for example, that patient's complaint be. And one thing that I certainly see a lot in the emergency department, I'd love if we could drill in this, I've seen a lot of questions in the chat on it, is the patient who presents with subacute or chronic back pain. Um, and I'll tell you that that has always been a therapeutic challenge for me in the emergency department. I've recently developed what I think are some outstanding tools in my toolkit. Uh, but I know that uh, as we were listening to your wonderful presentation, Sergey, that there was a little bit of, I don't know, consternation or surprise, or I think we were all taken aback when a certain Dr. Friedman published a certain trial comparing <laughs> naproxen, cyclobenzaprine, and placebo, um, that back pain is very difficult. And it, it seems like nothing works half the time. And I, I would love to explore what your tips and tricks are uh, for back pain. I'd love to hear everybody's tips and tricks for back pain. Sergey. Sharma, I'm looking at you too, because at me. Okay. if there's something I know, it's that, um, you know, I'm a, a proud Navy grad. And if there's something I know, it's that army guys get low back pain when they're crawling around all the time and they can't be on our beautiful ships. Yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, the, the saying goes, there's no such thing as the light infantry, right? These guys are carrying <laughs> around these heavy backpacks everywhere they go, you know? And uh, I was, you know, joking with, you know, some of the military PAs and trying to entice them to come to this course because the, the joke among the service members everywhere is PAs, docs, in the military, MPs, it's 800 milligrams Motrin, TID, you know, and if the pain's really bad, we'll give you a shot of Toradol. And so we've talked a lot about that today. You know, I think it's great that we mentioned that here. I think it's super important to, to talk about the, the analgesic ceiling here when we talk about NSAIDs and how there's not like improved efficacy with that Ketorlac injection. Um, you know, I, I like to go multimodal as well, you know, and, and, and maybe there is some aspect of the whole, I'm giving the patient so many things to do that like to some degree, they're just kind of, they're, they're at least doing more than the one thing. Cause often what is the, it's unimodal. Well, I tried Tylenol and it didn't work. So I'm in the ER or I tried ibuprofen yesterday and it didn't work. So I'm in the ER. And so let's combine well, maybe not combine Tylenol and Motrin anymore, right? Because apparently that was another just, you know, myth busted for me, you know, because that's, that's a common practice of mine. A lot of my, you know, peers know I'm always doling out two Tylenol, two ibuprofen here for a lot of these pain conditions. So maybe not anymore. Okay, but topicals are a great way to go. I'm very few people go with topical lidocaine. A lot of folks go like, oh, yeah, topical lidocaine, I do that, you know, but they're saying they use menthol or other stuff. And I feel like the topical lidocaine, people are shocked in the ER how much relief they get with your topical lidocaine. Um, back pain, I'm, you know, there's still confusion about like, well, do I ice it or do I heat it? And like, you're not going to damage that by, by doing ice, but I'm often telling people, well, if it's a strain sprain, let's do some gentle heat. And here in the ER, I'm going to give you a home therapy program you can start to do tonight for your back pain that you you got from lifting or crawling or things like that a few days ago here. So um, I, I think that opening the patient's eyes up to how many ways there are to treat those kinds of low back pain, and then also setting expectations. Like, hey, uh, you're probably gonna hurt for about three or four weeks, regardless okay. of what I do. There's definitely a couple things I wanna explore in back pain. And I, I, I wanna hear 
you know, Ken's got his his uh, mind wrapped around the data on this better than anybody <laughs> I know. Things that I that always come up to mind are the third and fourth and fifth line therapies here. Is I think we should tackle some steroids and low back pain. I'd love to hear what what the the data is saying on steroids and low back pain. And then I'll tell you that when I move into my further line, and I know Sergey has some excellent fourth and fifth line interventions, is that I've really become a TCA guy. I've been doing a lot of nortriptyline, ten milligrams, Q eight hours PRN for the treatment of low back pain. Based Based off some, you know, extrapolatable studies here, and Ken, I'm ready to fight you on this. I'm ready to go. I that, thought we were just going to fight over pineapple on pizza, but okay. well, listen, it's delicious. <laughs> it's a but, hill I'm going to die on. There's at least some data to suggest that one in four to one in five patients may respond very well to low dose TCAs for the treatment of radiculopathic low back pain. So you mean 20 to 25 percent? You mean the placebo effect? <laughs> He's coming at <laughs> when compared to placebo. There it was. Right, um, that, it, right in there. You yeah, know. I know, and I don't yeah, want to be a that, nihilist. I feel the pain. Yeah, I don't. Want, the Look, nihilism can. You know, get to I you, do though. think that uh, people have a belief that it's good to rub things. I mean, when you, you know, when you were injured as a kid and playing little league, they'd say "walk it off" kind of thing, or or rub it, and the idea of ice and heat. And now you can go to the drugstore and buy the. If you go to the salon pass. They have about five different things that you can put onto your back. They have a tens unit you can buy for like thirty-five dollars. You know this, this, that you can try that. You can try the lidocaine patch. You can try the methyl salicylate patch. You've got the 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 rub of the of the NSAIDs now. Rub that on. The idea of touching, feeling, is is kind of like it's more complex than just giving a little pill here. And so I think that the idea of uh, dazzling them with footwork may help in some of these cases. So, you know, our, our followers and people that come to our courses always kind of want to know like a specific case or a specific thing, that patient that comes all the time. So let me just frame a quick patient with back pain and you tell me what you would do. So the patient comes in, it's a 40 year old male. He has a known slip disc, right? He tells you that to begin with it hurts. Well, did you take any medicine? Oh yeah. I took the, I took the Motrin. I took the Tylenol. Um, I even took one of the uh, Percocets that, you know, this other doctor gave me nothing worked. Okay. You do your workup, whether you find something on the exam, maybe something questionable. Let's just say you get all the way down the path and you get an MRI. Okay. Let's just say that you've done that because this happens a lot in some of my ERs that I work in because we have observation units and people that have real pathology and we investigate it. Okay. So you find something, you do the MRI, they have a known disc problem. The MRI comes back and actually, you know what? It's not that bad, but they still have pain. So they don't need surgery. They're not getting admitted. They still have pain and they've been in your ER for 12 hours. If you're lucky. It's because pain is so subjective. And we know this from all the orthopedic studies that looked at arthritis of the hip and of the knee. And you can see x-rays where you're like, I don't know how you walked in here. And they're like, yeah, I'm here for uh, my blood pressure. You know, they're not even there about your knee. I don't know how the knee x-ray got done. And, and, and it's crazy. And then you see other people, like you said, on an MRI or something, very mild disease. Yeah. And it has no direct correlation to the level of their pain. So pain is so subjective. So we, but we're dazzled by, Ooh, look at this large magnet that showed something, you know, it, it's subjective. So, okay. But then, you know, you've also ruled out, like, did you miss a triple A? Did you miss sure, this appendicitis? Sure. Okay. You've already done all that, but now you just want to help Mrs. Jones's low back pain. What are you giving her? Uh, Tylenol Motrin and the, uh, Percocet didn't work for her. What do you send her home with? This is a real, this happens every day. Four out of five well, patients for me. Well, if you look at definition of what you describe, neuropathic component of pain is not amenable for opioids, NSAIDs, and acetaminophen. They just don't work. No. So, so give me, a, give me, a, give right. us a package. Ketamine. What's the package? So package is, well, are we talking about ED management or to send patient home with? Uh, maybe a dose now and something for later. Hmm. I like that. Right. So. <laughs> You know, it depends on patient presentation. If they're ambulatory and they're working around everything else, and as Ken mentioned too, MRI doesn't really show much of anything else, you can do topical. You can do topical lidocaine patch, and you can probably put them on a short course steroid taper because some okay. degree of inflammation around the disc may probably be amenable to metrodose pack. You know, 
I'll attend to somewhere agree with uh, Rick in the sense that besides the high quality randomized trials, TCAs for patient with neuropathic component to it may benefit for the short term, but we need to be very kind of the fact that not benign medication once again, even though TCAs are notorious to not have a whole host of unwelcome side effects that people may actually have low compliance to it because you just don't tolerate them very well. All right. But, and then you just talk to patients once again, when patient goes home, it's the same principle. I mean, topicals, maybe lidocaine patch, maybe sugars of steroids and, uh, you know, plus minus TCA, but then you just rationalize. That's what's going to happen. There's no obvious pathology. We know you're hurting. We acknowledge your pain. These are the best medication right now that might help you or may not. You and know. backing backing off on that NSAID while they're on the prednisone well, pack. NSAID should not be prescribed for patients with neuropathic component yeah. to it. They just don't work. NSAIDs don't work for neuropathic pain as good as people thought it might be. In DD, however, if the patient really in trouble and have a neuropathic component, you, you can use heavy guns, such as low-dose ketamine infusion. You can use lidocaine infusion. Okay. You know, you can use you know, trigger point injections. I don't know. There's are probably some value to it. Rick knows better than anybody else, I guess, and can as well. You might be block them as well. You can use, you know, erector spina block and it can probably go all the way down and you can bring them great deal relief. ED management, I'm less concerned to be honest with you <clears throat> than patients send them patient home back. <clears throat> okay. And I think, I think when you send people home, Sergey, and obviously this depends on their social situation and their insurance. I, as a Canadian, I do recognize that there's another component to healthcare um, in other jurisdictions, but uh, you know, it's not as, you know, as Rick said, as, as, you know, people are looking for that answer in a pill and it, there's psychological issues there. There's sociological issues there and be, ha, having a pain clinic, a group of uh, dedicated, committed, compassionate individuals that can manage these chronic pain people are so helpful. And, you know, while we, while we can give them temporary relief and that's what they're, we're there for as emergency uh, providers and clinicians, we want to make sure First of all, is there an emergency? Is there a triple A? Okay, no, good. All right. Help them out today and then help them out tomorrow by getting the right person, the right clinicians that can help them. And it's not usually just about pain. It might be access to food, access to a job, access to this and that. So as soon as somebody uh, has a sense of self-worth with regards to something else, their pain becomes less important. And there is uh, psychological studies that show those types of outcomes improve once people's overall living situation improves. So it may not be just give them a, something, a, a pill in a bottle and stuff. Yeah. Right. That's a good can, you, uh, can you give us an easy question now? <clears throat> okay. So yeah. our, fr our, our buddy Mel, uh, I'll, I'll leave out his last name. Mel wants to know about intranasal ketamine. Let's talk about it. I use it. I use intranasal ketamine in the emergency department, not infrequently. Um, I think it's a fantastic uh, method to administer low dose analgesic therapy with fairly good response uh, without the need for uh, invasive access. Uh, How much and I've you had a lot it? of success. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, I do a lot of 50 milligrams, so about 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Rick, would you say that's. I, uh, that's uh, like uh, there's good evidence behind that, or is that one of those things where you're kind of going a little bit <clears throat> to the right of, uh, of, you know, what's recommended? Well, it does seem like most of the evidence when we look at intranasal ketamine for analgesia comes out of the pediatric population. And I, I always look back to uh, a certain Christian Frome et al. from uh, Dr. Motov's shop from back in the day that looked at the comparison of intranasal ketamine versus intranasal fentanyl for the treatment of pediatric pain. Um, and I believe it was in uh, acute musculoskeletal fracture, if I remember, right? Um, and found that fentanyl was superior in that pediatric cohort. Now, when I synthesize also that with my desire to limit opioid exposure, particularly in adults uh, where I would be concerned about uh, uh, newfound exposure to opioids. I, and then I also remember that ketamine has other indications that opioids may not be indicated for. Certainly opioids, a wonderful uh, treatment approach in a patient with an acute fracture. Uh, the use of ketamine across the sort of analgesic spectrum has a, a little bit more of a Swiss army approach to the treatment of pain. Yeah, yeah, there were it a comes lot of... out of kids. It comes out of kids, like uh, Rick was saying. The mm. the problem with you know ketamine is a second line intranasal thing for for me for children. It's it's fentanyl because of the the reason uh, the previous research, but the challenge with children is you know from November to March, 
I mean, there's only stuff coming out of their nose. There's not much <laughs> stuff going in their nose. And so, you know, my, it's hard to dose it correctly because it's, yeah, they're just all. Mm. And it's a beautiful point. And I just want to add to it. The data pre-lab, once you guys all totally on it, most of the data, if not all, comes out of pediatric literature. But my personal experience is, you know, even children without boogers and having normal open passages, they don't seem to be tolerating intranasal and search of any sort of kind very well. They're not entirely comfortable with it. And I don't want to bu bust anybody bubbles and such. For every reason, I actually turn towards nebulized route rather than um, intranasal. Well, we're going to have to talk you, about nebulized. We have to take number one. So your ED, your ED pharmacist is going to get all up in arms about that one. So Oh, no. Um, my ED pharmacist is very supportive and everything else. And another thing is when it comes to that literature, remember, for intranasal route to work, you need to use properly bait-based dose. And you, in adult patients, you require highly concentrated solutions that not ordinarily usually stocked in the EDs because you need to be 100 milligram per ml for adult patients at 1 to 1.5 mg per kilo dose. And if you're not doing it, if you use smaller concentration, you run into the side that you may be underdosing, or if you do too, too much, then this medication yeah, the will flip be leaking side out. Is, yeah, that there's a med error and you there's give it an error, IM right. or IV, and yeah. now that person's down for hours. Not that but, it's you know going to affect the respiratory system usually, but... But at okay. the same token, it's a beautiful thing to use from the get-go at triage and pre-hospital route in a situation that you need something quick, not, may not be as definitive as, you know, via intravenous access or what have you, but it's definitely deserved place in emergency medicine. If we only right. had nitrous. <laughs> so I'm going to switch Ten topics trucks. a little bit because now we're going to do a giveaway. <laughs> okay. First of all, I just highlighted another question here, and it's talking about lidocaine for renal colic. That's all I'm going to say. Um, however, this pain guide does talk a little bit about renal colic. So in our YouTube chat, the first person to tell me, let's see, what kind of question should we give them? Should we make it an easy question or should we make it a hard question, guys? What I say think? we, I say it should be the author of a certain trial. Uh, I think we should ask. I'm wondering who would that author be? That's. I question. think that we should ask who is the first author of the Lidoket trial. Is what I think we should ask. Oh, okay, was a that's the question. That's the winner of the first pain book. <laughs> the Lidoket trial. The first author. Yeah, Lidoket trial. Who wants to give me an answer? We're going to scour. Okay. Well, we're waiting for uh, answers. Oh, Mel. Mel's excited that we answered his question, but uh, he wants to put more stuff up the nose. All right. So I, I am cheating by knowing there's a great, so if, for those of you that don't know how this book works, it's essentially like you name the problem, here's how we treat the pain. And there's a whole little page on renal colic right here. So I, I like get the idea know. with the QR codes at the bottom, where if you want to learn more, you just do that thing. Oh yeah. That's uh, let it's me very, show you what that. Very hip. That's what that looks like. So you can just scan it with your phone. And there's like all these little guys who are, are clutching their back. The typical, I have back pain uh, picture. Um, so, okay. well, can, can you tell me how a little book like that costs $27? It's a little tiny book. Don't do that to him. It's, it's oh, not that's, yeah, Qual I, quality, not to, quantity. Even as an immigrant, I'm about to start pleading fifth, six, seven, and 112 because I'm not liberty to even say anything about the price. Let's I get back to read. renal colic. Yeah, yeah let's go back to renal book. colic. <laughs> okay, so poor EM residents that are benefiting from that, you know, elevated price here. Come on, it's the Emra. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. I'm sorry, guys, but so Rick Bucata and I had a very long conversation before the uh, faculty forum started tonight about lidocaine and renal colic. Now, uh, Pescator has written about this. Okay, he. He and I have actually, well, last time we talked about this was in Key West. Um, now I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you run with it. Well, listen, I am uh, happy to say that I have used lidocaine for renal colic a number of times. And a lot of that was many years ago. There was for a long time, a decent amount of observational literature that looked at the use of intravenous lidocaine for the treatment of renal colic and found it to be effective. In fact, the ad observational literature suggested that it was just as effective as morphine. And so I'll be honest that I, as a, um, uh, some would say cowboy, some would say <laughs> over adopter of practices, um, was happy to bring that into my analgesic armamentarium until the publication of the Lidocet trial. Now, the Lidocet trial was published by, do we have a, uh, a respondent yet? Uh, let's see. 
Sharma, are you seeing anything? I David don't see anything. David Ribadu named one Motov, comma, S as the lead author of the Lido Kid trial. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. Oh, I hey, mean, what's that? Nailed it. We found the first author of the Lido Kid trial. So I'm going to kick Nailed it over it. to the first author of the Lido Kid trial. <laughs> David, just a quick thing. David, you need to send me an email at proceduralpause at gmail.com. Got it? Proceduralpause at gmail.com. You get your copy. I'll write it in there. So yeah, I, I agree with Rick. There was a time when I had some euphoric tendencies to push for a variety of non-opioid analgesic in the pursuit of finding some either similar or somewhere compatible to opioid analgesia because we all been trying to sort of curb this opioid epidemic and such. And I've done the same thing as Rick did. I've given intravenous lidocaine to several patients several years ago based on some observational study and pretty much in all the studies that weren't done in the United States at that time. And it just so happened we were lucky enough with my team to put together lidocaine trial when we compared intravenous lidocaine to Ketorolac or and to a combination of lidocaine and Ketorolac alone. And the results of the study showed that lidocaine was found to be inferior to definitely Ketorolac and to a combination of Ketorolac and lidocaine. So and based on our studies, we've concluded that at present, lidocaine cannot and probably cannot be recommended as a first-line defense when it comes to renal colic patients. And based on available literature, NSAIDs are the first gun, and there's a great deal of support and really good data from any type of pharmacology, pharmacokinetic, what have you, that there are the class of drug, go one uh, class of drug to go to. You might well, consider using there a very kind of like avant-garde movement of this no anal, uh, no morphine uh, in the uh, emergency department where they were going to give like a, uh, IV acetaminophen, uh, uh, IV, uh, uh, IV uh, ketorolac, uh, IV uh, ketamine, and I, what was the fourth one they were going to give? Oh, is it lidocaine? Lide. They were going to give four drugs by infusion when they could have given like, you know, four grams of milligrams of morphine, they were going to give it this because they were so no morphine right. here. Well, so I'm the wet blanket. I'm the wet blanket, <clears throat> Sergey. So I'm going to just, you know, like, hello, Ken Milne, I'm the wet blanket. So there was a 2012 randomized control trial looking at renal colic versus morphine. And it was at RCT. And uh, there's no high quality evidence that lidocaine um, is, uh, a drug of first choice for renal colic for sure. And there's no good evidence that it works. Uh, and then there was a RCT done in 2018 that was just looking at painful conditions. And again, no high quality evidence of benefit. And that was by another Dr. Silva. So it was not Dr. Sergey, but Dr. Silva. <laughs> so, so, you know, we don't have good evidence that lidocaine infusions work. So okay. the only thing, there's one stipulation, maybe just, I'm sorry, I know we, uh, we're on, on the clock here, is that let's just say, hypothetical scenario that patient have country patient has a contraindication to NSAIDs, and for a variety of reasons, they may not tolerate opioids very well. And then what do you do, right? You know, intravenous acetaminophen in 2010, it was like analgesic orgasm, like we found mm -hmm. the cure for everything. Right. And unfortunately, it was a very short-lived orgasm and at this point that nobody uses anymore because technically in the ED, this, I told you, acetaminophen is acetaminophen, no matter how you package it. But point being, maybe on a case-by-case -case basis, when there are some issues with NSAIDs or opioids, you might consider uh, using intravenous lidocaine with the premise that you, as long as you understand this is not a go one or go two guy, you probably might be able to be successful. Yeah. And I think that's great because, you know, it, it, just because we don't have good evidence of efficacy doesn't mean it doesn't work. That's not the claim. That's not the assertion that this doesn't work. It's just, we don't have good evidence that it does work. And that's a different sort of thing. And sometimes you're down on the fourth or fifth, or if you're really smart, like Rick, you're down on the seventh or eighth, because he's doing injections and things. And I'm not doing all those trigger point injections that he's learned to do. So yeah, absolutely. It all depends. And you may end up requiring to go to lidocaine, just set patients expectations mm -hmm. that, you know, we're going to try this. Um, it's because of all these reasons. And again, I think patients just like to hear that you're thinking about them and that you're spending some time with them and that you're actually not just looking at the computer all the time and putting in your orders and doing whatever you are on the computer and actually yeah. just looking them in the eye and saying, let's work through this together. You're an expert at you. You know, your body better than I do right? You've lived in that body for 50 something years or something like that. You're the expert. I'm the expert at the medicine. And between the two experts, we can come up with a good plan to move forward. Yeah. 
Martha, uh, uh, we're having I, a great time here and we could probably go on for a few hours here. But- I know I'm moving. Look, I, I want to get to your move along, but I have to address this because it's very important and it's one word and it's fibromyalgia and hang on before we go on all these different tangents about it. I just want you to think about that patient for a moment that comes in. And again, I like presenting that real person that comes in. I have pain. I always have pain. I'm in worse pain today. It's a little different than my usual pain. Um, you know, you, you do your workup or you don't depending on how they're presenting, but this patient has pain all the time and they have given this diagnosis of chronic pain syndrome. What do we do? I, um, you know, was fortunate in my time in, in pain medicine to see a lot of patients with fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia and chronic regional pain syndrome. And I learned a lot about excellent ways to treat them both acutely and chronically. And I'd like to start with their acute treatment that I would uh, approach in the emergency department. And, and you can't think of a better place for the implementation of ketamine. Um, when we think about these chronic pain syndromes, it comes with both the uh, increase in peripheral nociception and uh, hyperalgesia and the peripheral Uh, nervous system, but also central sensitization and a maladaptive nociceptive pathway. And we have to like think back to our uh, anatomy a little bit and get back into our anatomy and physiology a little bit and think where is that pain center in the brain and think about the insular cortex. And then we need to think about the limbus that surrounds the insular cortex. And we're getting deep into the the anatomy and pathophysiology here, but the limbus um, is, you know, where you have a saturation of the NMDA receptor. We think about about anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, also known as limbic encephalitis. And that internal capsule is surrounded by the NMDA receptor. So infusion of pain dose ketamine is 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram over 15 to 20 minutes really does a wonder for these patients. It blockades those NMDA receptors that are surrounding the internal, the, uh, internal cap, the insular cortex and breaks those maladaptive nociceptive pathways that have formed. And the patient not only gets acute analgesia, but they also get long lasting effects because you were able to sever that maladaptive nociceptive pathway. Very cool. So ED is, is great thing, but the then question is what do you do when they go home? Yeah. So this is where I think I'm going to take a left turn from a lot of people, but I am uh, one to prescribe ketamine for patients to go home with. If they have good success in the emergency department, I am happy to prescribe 30 milligram ketamine lozenges. And I have a lot of patients who have had tremendous success with this. Now there are certain patients for who that's not going to be appropriate. Now, certainly if you're going to prescribe ketamine lozenges, it's got a, it's a patient that has to have the financial ability to obtain it and also has to have access to a compounding pharmacy to obtain it. But if this patient otherwise is going home, this is a patient for whom combination SNRIs and TCAs are completely appropriate. Do you think 30, 30 milligram tablets is a lot or little, or do you think if someone's new to doing this, maybe they could just do a few and touch base with the primary care doc, maybe something a little more Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally a place that's appropriate to prescribe what you're comfortable with and what's appropriate for the patient and to have that warm handoff with a primary care or pain specialist who'll be able to continue that care in the outpatient arena. Well, just to make everybody feel happy, out of this 30 milligram after oral route, only 16% gets absorbed into systemic circulation. So if you count to it, it's a anesthetic of anesthetic dose. It's really, really minuscule as dose, but what Rick is saying is on the level, at that low level of ketamine, it's still going to be properly effective for those patients. I just wanted to add based on the available evidence, you know, TCAs, SSRIs, SSNRIs, and um, physical exercise. That's probably the thing that actually been studied and has some very good evidential support to it. No NSAIDs, no acetaminophen, no steroids, no anything else pretty much would not be working. And uh, to follow up with that approach, um, Martha, you presented, you know, supposedly this difficult patient that everybody's going to just roll their eyes at, make some jokes about. And so if you do the exact opposite, you will have an amazing therapeutic experience with that person. And you can say, wow, you must be exhausted. Fighting pain every day is just, I, I don't know how you do it. It must yeah. be exhausting. You say something like that up front, as opposed to, yeah, I hear you're, you got the bro, you know, like, and be dismissive, the fibro or oh, the bro no. or whatever yeah, you're calling yeah. it. 
So, so, but I've seen that, right? And, and oh, I, don't yeah. care, oh, yeah. I don't care what you label it. I don't care what you label it. What I care about is the person and how they're feeling, not what label they put on it. So there's lots of baggage that comes with that, that diagnosis. So I just try to approach it with, uh, wow, you must be exhausted. It is yeah. pain is an exhausting thing to have. So well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you came in today to talk to me. Good words of wisdom. And speaking of getting exhausted, I know that our listeners are probably getting a little tapped out. So as Diane Bernbauer, who is not here this, uh, this month for our faculty forum, I miss her, uh, but she loves our rapid fire. Yes. No's. Uh, so we're, we're moving no. on. Yes. No. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Ah, no. So we're going to move on to our rapid fire. Yes. No's. The first question is, can patients with liver disease, transplant, hepatitis, et cetera, take acetaminophen? Yes. 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 That's a yes. You know, Thank can I inter you. Just interrupt here? Sir, no, it's I, yes, I no. Would, it's uh, yes, no. You can't I have know, an opinion. I know, but I, but He's overriding the rules already. Come on now. We get time. <laughs> He's in charge. I guess we can let yes, it Yes, exactly slide. right. Um, <laughs> we can pull the plug out at any time. He's going to cut your feed, Ken. Be careful. <laughs> I wanted to ask, Sergey, do you have any feeling about this idea that uh, the um, – I, I get the sense that you're not too fond of uh, the analgesic properties of acetaminophen, but what happens when they took the uh, daily limit from four grams to three grams? Don't you think that was kind of like a, a bad idea? You know, I think that uh, personally, I think that uh, they kind of allowed us to, to uh, effectively underdose people when we give a max of three grams a day. So it's a good question. There, in theory, there is a potential that acetaminophen might have an analgesic ceiling. Data comes from the dental literature, and it's actually lower than you think. Some actually did. I came across speculated 500 milligram per dose three times a day. So it's 1,500 milligram per 24 hours for pain from acetaminophen, even less than four grams. You know, the, the drop, the reason, because people start becoming more aware of the fact that and it's us that we start combining acetaminophen with opioids and people start, you know, misusing opioids and their potential to have overdose on acetaminophen and then liver issues and failure in transplant, what have you. But from analgesic perspective, to be honest with you, even if you drop from four to three, I don't think you're going to have much of a difference from analgesia. Acetaminophen is primarily antipyrexic drug and should be treated as such. You can stick to four gram, but I'm honestly, I've been using 500 milligram within, you know, in addition to uh, ibuprofen, but I'm no longer doing this, you can go to one gram per dose three, four times a day. But my opinion, there is no much of a difference between four to three gram when it comes to pain. I have a yeah. fact, I, I think that this combination drug, they're gonna sell a million bajillion dollars worth of this <laughs> stuff, a bajillion. And I'm sure it costs much more than either drug alone. And Keep America will simple. still be in pain. Simple yes. ingredients. All right. I'll, all right. Okay. I'll, oh, you know what's interesting? Now oh, oh, no, no. This is what. Yes, do no. you know the dose of ibuprofen in this capsule? 250. It's garbage. Yeah, that and the Tylenol dose is really low. So that if we do talk about analgesic still, we become a little cautious, but at least give something we can work with. There isn't data, and all the data I came across which showed that anything below 400 doesn't really work as good as four and above for analgesic still perspective. Now they drop to 250 and 325 of acetaminophen. It's like uh, you need this to is take a handful yeah. of them, I think. You but know? they're using, you can use two capsules at the same okay, time. Thank you. So we'll see how they All right, I will, I'll, All right. Okay, I'll play with well. Yes, no. Okay, yeah. I got it. Okay, moving on. Uh, and we did talk about this earlier uh, before we went on air, but essentially uh, Celebrex, yes or no? Sure, why not? Yes. I mean, well, for why? I mean, what? Pain. When it's indicated, yeah. When it's a, there's a, a pain to be relieved by NSAIDs, yeah. That was a long okay. answer. Yeah. No. Okay. No. Wait. Who said no? There's some yeses and some noes. What? Why? Me? Yes. Uh, I, I don't think there's any superiority to it, and it costs more. Okay. Well, so no, there is not. That's true. I will give you that. And there is that 10-year study that talked about whether or not NSAIDs caused an increased risk of stroke or heart attack, and they compared that to Celebrex as well as those taking ibuprofen and naproxen, right? It was but Vioxx then they, that was pulled off the market because right, of that. Right, but that spawned a lot of, of conversation, and Celebrex was roped into this. Now, as a child, I had juvenile arthritis, and I took Celebrex, and it and I couldn't function without it, and I thought it was a great drug. And um, I think it turned out all right, you know, but... I never had an ulcer. You, you I never could had have been it. so much better. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, no, yes, Jeez. no. Okay. Okay. Yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, no. You're breaking okay. your own rule here, Martha. 
fine. You guys gave your opinion. <laughs> I said no. That's all I said until I was asked. <laughs> fine. Okay. Moving on to the next question. Uh, we sort of covered a little bit about ketamine already, but I am going to ask it. If someone comes in and wants ketamine for their chronic pain, are you going to give it to them? Yes. yes. Why not? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thing, yes. Sure. Why not? Okay. Oh, I like this next one. What is your perspective on the following sciatic nerve blocks, piriformis muscle injections, lidocaine and marcaine for sciatic piriformis syndrome? Basically, this person wants to know, should I stick a needle in it? With an ultrasound. Yeah. And we have lots of videos about that on the procedural pause. Just so Absolutely. You know. An erector spine, a plain block, an SI injection, all well within the scope of the emergency physician, particularly with that ultrasound that's gathering dust. Aha. Uh -huh. Ooh. Yours is gathering dust? Yeah, I guess it should have gathered dust. Wait, hold on. Let's see. I No, nope. yes, to... no questions, Martha. Yes, no. Focus. Sorry. Focus. Okay, focus. I, I, blew it too. I was going to pull it out, but it's, it looks like it's not in my drawer. I don't know. I don't know where it is. Ellie knows how to use it, my six-year-old. So, Okay. okay. You, uh, let's move on to the next one. Gabapentin for neuropathic pain. Yes. Not acutely. No. Yeah, I think Sergey mentioned that is that like the trick is there's titration involved and where are they going to follow up and things like that. Right. So just to put them on it with an undefined endpoint is real tricky. I hate so, gabapentin. That's my opinion. I hate it. So once, but you've narrowed very nicely for a perfectly identifiable neuropathic component of pain, their evidential support the gabapentin is working. It takes time, time. to get to the it dose. Does. It is a titratable. And, and you need it's somewhere to follow. Easy. That's the key. You need somebody see, to follow. My job doesn't give me any time. Right. So well, I feel like prescribing this drug sometimes it, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't help. But the only word of uh, caution is recent data. You just need to be very kind of the fact that you should not be prescribing gabapentin or pregabalin or uh, gabapentin to patients who are in chronic opioid use. Great. It's going to get a little out of control. We're right. seeing more gabapentin abuse as well, correct? That's becoming a drug of abuse, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Well, they made it a scheduled drug about two years ago because of the concerns about that. Um, it serves as an opioid potentiator at first, and then the worsens uh, opioid-induced respiratory depression at second. So a rate of dying from combination of opioids and uh, anticonvulsants, such as uh, gabapentin, is significantly higher than rates of dying from respiratory depression uh, opioids alone. Okay, it's time for another book giveaway, and then we're going to do one last question and the final uh big money prize the um the award oscar goes to will be will be uh the best question asked tonight so for our next giveaway let's see i would like to ask the question should we give him an easy question yeah mm -hmm. yes okay so i have to be the first one to answer then I want to give this uh, question to our previous CCME members and people that come to our courses that, that uh, have been there before. Which faculty member who, who either speaks at or presents at our course does a live uh, physical exam for the neurological patient? Which faculty member gives a live neurological presentation on a patient. Oh, somebody's writing. Let's see what they say. I'll give you a hint. It's a he. And they're not on uh, the panel right now. And they're not on the panel right now. Greg oh, Henry! I think Brandon got it. There you go. Hi, Brandon. Way to go. Good job. Yeah, we Dr. Greg Henry. Who One we of love. The founders of the specialty. And he always. All right, Martha. I think it's time to wrap up here. All right, time to wrap up. So uh, we are going to go through a bunch of questions here that you've asked. And uh, Sharma has been handling the YouTube questions. I've been handling the pre-submitted uh, Slido questions. And we want to kind of just come up with one last final question that we think is really awesome. Um, I do see quite a few in the YouTube. So Sharma, what do you think is the best one? And who do you think deserves this free course? No pressure. You're just going to make me pick someone to get a thousand dollar prize here on the spot. Okay, <laughs> let me figure this out real quick. Do you want uh, us to buy you some time? 
Buy, yeah, let's please, buy some, uh, let's, let's yeah. buy some time. Let's a buy some time. A song and dance routine, something three minutes plus or minus thirty seconds would be great. Okay, so uh, you know, let's just let's just well, end really with thanking all of the people that. Yeah, have been I was going to say we could we could spend the time thanking uh, all of you for taking your evening and uh, spending it with us and hopefully a, a lot of listeners. And I I do again. Um, there's so much good information, sir, Gay, that you have been able to provide over the years. And, and, and the capsule summary of this half hour, that was terrific. I, and I really, really appreciate you taking a stand on things and, and not, not saying it depends, it depends, it depends. Um, and I think it's very helpful because many times uh, there are many things that we do chronically. It's always been done that way. And we just need someone to say enough that's not right. And Thank let's you. remind remind people that they can listen to this later. They can listen to Sergey's talk again. Um, it will be accessible on our site for you to download and listen to anytime you want. And in addition, if you want a copy of the pain guide, you can order that. It's on Amazon. They can get it on Amazon. Emmer.org. Oh, well, is it on Amazon too, Emmer, though? Because that's Emmer.org. I know, but Amazon I've Prime. Heard of it. I've heard of it. <laughs> you'll have it in your hand in a couple of hours exactly pickup station um and and finally you know our courses are going to happen in 2021 we do have a course coming up in july the original boot camp is going to be occurring in las vegas and you can go to our website for more information about the course yeah we want and you we, all to be immunized by the way by the yeah time please it, you know we're gonna to have to show your id card that you got your shots yep and right. and if you have what? Have you uh, made a decision? Yeah, you know what? I, I think uh, I think it pays to be first sometimes. And so the very first person who actually uh, you know opened up a pretty good discussion, I feel like about managing pediatric pain. And she kind of went down the fracture route here, and we kind of talked about you know ibuprofen and you know uh, you know intravenous fentanyl and you know uh, non therapy uh, non pharmacologic treatment, lots of ways to treat uh, acute fracture pain in kiddos here. And that was Rebecca. McMillan. Okay. So Becky or McMillan, you're it. You win one free course from CCME. Okay. You can go with the original boot camp, the advanced boot camp, the heart course, high risk emergency medicine here. Whatever you like, uh, go ahead and drop your email um, to procedural pause at gmail.com and you can work with Martha and we'll get you that course. Okay. Live or streaming, you know. Not gonna tell you how to or, either way. Or if you prefer, you can too. spend the weekend with uh, Rick Bucata at his home in Los Angeles for a full 72 hours where he he uh, <laughs> lets you stay in his studio. No, I'm only joking. You can't do Socially that. Socially distance, of course. Don't do that. Hey, listen, so, I want to thank you it. all for taking your time. Uh, you, you were a ter terrific panel and you have so much experience and I was appreciative of your sharing it with us tonight. So thank you all. And thank you for listening and, and tuning in. We hope to do some of these in the future. Bye-bye. Bye for now. I take it, I hope that